at this morning uh, that actually took place here on the earth is in Luke chapter 9. And in Luke chapter 9, this is the only miracle that is recorded in all four of the Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the only one that's written in all four. If you haven't picked up a journal, though, I want to encourage you. We're now in the second part of this journal. This journal covers January and February, and we are looking this month at the table Uh, And at the table, everything changes. Do you remember growing up as a kid? I don't know if this was the case for you. And you longed to sit at the adult table. Uh, That was like my goal in life. I just wanted to be at the adult table. Because where we were, we... um, we, we had, uh, they didn't have card tables, and we were Church of God. You couldn't have cards and a card table anyway. I mean, that would have been just like totally wrong. Um, but we didn't have like these little card tables, but we had these little, um, uh, these, these little tables that were like for kids, and it just felt so degrading to sit at these little, these little tables all of the time. And at the adult table, they had the food at their table, and that was just wrong to me because they didn't have to get up and walk across the room to get more whatever, turkey or whatever it was. They had it at their table and could just reach and grab whatever they wanted. And so I thought if I could ever make it to the adult table to, to sit with and get away from these kid tables, I thought I will have made it in life. And man, I would love to go back to the kid table, wouldn't you? Uh, just to be in the simplicity of life. There's significance, though, in tables, Uh, And here in the book of Luke, we're going to, over the four Sundays in this month, we're going to look at four different tables. And one of the challenges that we want you to do is to invite somebody to sit at the table with you and let them experience the presence of God in your life. And we're not saying go preach a sermon to the people that gather together around your table, but just by living as a child of God, let them experience and sitting at your table Let them experience the Christ that is within you, the light that comes out to pierce the darkness. And so this month, we ask, if you would, to find two opportunities. You even in this month get an extra day because this is a leap year. So you get 29 days to find two opportunities to sit at the table with somebody that you normally wouldn't sit at. Uh, sit with. And so this month, find somebody, invite them to the table, and spend the time leading up to that opportunity in prayer, asking the presence of God to show up. And follow along in the journal. There's daily readings, and then there's, uh, if you're in a community group, then there's um, some readings for your community group. But pick up one of these. There's some in the back if you don't have one of those already. Luke chapter 9 this morning, Uh, we're going to take a look here kind of at the the front of this. Uh, You may be familiar with this passage of scripture. It's one that I think in every children's book that's ever been written, this section has been included in there where Jesus uh, feeds the 5,000. Let me give you a little bit of a background here though. Jesus has just worked some amazing miracles. It's just been like a season of miracles for Jesus. It's just been over and over and over. Miracle, 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 miracle. And you can go back and you can read here at the beginning of Luke um, of, of some of these miracles that Jesus has done. And the word has gotten out. So Jesus has called his disciples. He's launched his earthly ministry after waiting um, some three decades here on the earth. And he is now into this ministry of of doing miracles. He sends out the 12. They actually come back and they tell of of the miracles that were worked actually through them. And then we get to this place in Luke chapter 9. And we'll start reading in verse 10 if you would follow along. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. So they had been on their own little uh, trip journey here, and they're giving the report back. Then he, Jesus, took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we're in a remote place here. He replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we've only five loaves and bread, five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. 
But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were each that were left over. Now, I don't care about how much catering experience you have or how much restaurant business you have. Feeding 5,000 people is a huge, huge undertaking. And that was the feat that was presented here. That was the, the problem that was actually presented to Jesus here. But if you take a look at verse number 11, and this is just what I, just what I want to point out here as, before we get into this, this message this morning. Because I think that sometimes we get so caught up in the miracle that has happened here, we miss what actually leads up to this. In verse number 11... It says, so, so Jesus and the disciples have gone to a remote place. The disciples just came back from their, from their sending out, and they're back. They're giving the report to Jesus, and they just want some time alone together. And verse 11 happens. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. And what did he do? He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Here's the interesting part about this that I think we miss about this, this passage of Scripture. We get so focused on this huge catering feat that Jesus took, and we miss the crowds were following Jesus because of one thing. He had the presence of God with him. Listen, it doesn't matter what kind of amazing feeding ministry we have as a church. It doesn't matter what kind of amazing youth ministry we might have or what kind of outreach ministry we might have or what kind of teaching or discipleship ministry that we might have. If we miss the presence of God, then we have missed everything. Amen? If we miss the presence of God, then we miss everything. And that's what was luring the people to Jesus. Sometimes we get so caught up in the church, we think, oh, we need this, this, uh, this situation. We need to sing this song. We need to hear these types of messages. We need these types of ministries. We need to have this and this and this. And we start to compare ourselves to other churches. And we think, wow, look what they're doing through a thrift store. Look what they're doing through a feeding ministry. Look what they're doing in their youth ministry. Look what they're doing, wh whatever they are that they're doing. But listen, if we have all of that stuff, but we miss the presence of God, then we have failed as a church. And the reason the people were coming to this amazing catering ministry that Jesus had, that they didn't know that they were going to walk into, was they were following the presence of God. And so when we are inviting people to a table to, to just spend time with us, we better make sure that we have the presence of God with us. Because if not, then we have missed everything. The purpose of ministry is to make sure that we are sending and delivering the presence of God to wherever it is that he desires to go. And in verse 11, we actually see here that before the miracle comes, the presence of God preceded it. Our job as followers of Jesus Christ, our responsibility as his sons and daughters is to live and operate out of his presence. And so I show you all the time this triangle. I can't tell you how many times I've shared this triangle with you. But it is a reminder to me of our obligation to sit in his presence and I believe that Luke chapter 9, verse 10 through verse 17, the, the, the story here is the presence of God. It's, it's true there's a miracle that's attached to it, but it came out of experiencing the presence. And so what we have to do is sit here at the bottom of the triangle and sit in the presence of God before we go to the issue that needs to be done. And we will see what the, what, and we'll get into this of what the disciples actually did here and how they missed the bottom of the triangle and sitting in the presence of God and they were worried about the assignment of having to feed the 5,000 people. But Jesus did this amazing ministry because he carried with him the presence of God. How do you get the presence of God? You just sit with him. You just sit with him. Here in the bottom of the, you don't, you don't run up to whatever assignment it is. You just sit with God and say, God, I need to be in your presence today. You can't do that in a crowd you can't do that with lots of outside noise coming at you. 
You can only do this when it's just you and it's just the Lord and you're there and you say, God, I need your presence. And so I abandon myself and I invite your presence to come in and reign and take control of my life. Had Jesus not had that, the crowds wouldn't have followed. Had Jesus not carried the presence of the God who spoke the universe into existence, they wouldn't have cared. He would have just been another man here on the earth. But they knew something was different about him. What was different? What was different? He carried the presence of God with him. Now you say, well, you know, this is just a lot of, this is just a lot of stuff about Jesus because Jesus was God in the flesh. Absolutely he was God in the flesh. What did Jesus do when he came in the flesh? He came to fix the separation between God and man that sin brought into the world. And he did that on the cross so that God and man could have fellowship with one another. And he said, I am going to give you my Holy Spirit so that you can experience my presence continuously. So that the presence that they were experiencing in Luke chapter 9, the 5,000 people, the presence that they were experiencing is the presence that we can carry with us when we sit with God at the bottom of the triangle and not get so frustrated with our assignment. So what is frustrating you? Don't run to that frustration. Run to the presence of God so that then when you get to the situation that's frustrating you or causing you heartache or causing you a lot of grief or whatever, then you go into that situation, you go into that assignment with the presence of God. And listen, this is when life becomes joyous. This is what I truly believe it means to experience the joy of the Lord. Because this is when we realize we don't have to have all of the answers. It's God that has the answers. And we just walk in his presence. And when he says, this is what I want, then that's what you don't have to worry about the consequences of that. Because there are no surprises to God. Because when we're walking in his presence, things take care of themselves. Because his presence changes everything. And here's the amazing thing that I think about presence that we forget sometimes. Is when we are experiencing and we are living out of the presence of God, you realize that God actually sees you. Listen, God sees you. The creator of the universe. The one who spoke things into existence. And out of the abyss, out of the chaos, came, came the solar system, came the earth, came all of creation. He actually sees you when you are in his presence. But a part of being seen, we actually discover what our needs are. In the same way that the disciples who were in the presence here realized that there was an issue. And in order for us to experience miracles in our life, we have to realize the need that we have. That when you go to solve any math problem there is, you have to first know what the problem is. Because if you don't know that the problem is multiplication, and you try to answer that with addition, then you're going to get the wrong answer. But when you are in the presence of God, you are able to see, hey, look, this is a, there's a problem here. And the problem here is I've got to sit in the presence of God so that he can provide the answer to that. I don't have to come up with the answer. I don't have to know what needs to be done. I have a God who sees me, and I am living in his presence, and he's going to provide the answer. When you know the problem, then you can go to the one who has all of the answers. And then he can meet your need with whatever miracle that needs to take place. The first Step to a miracle is realizing that there's a problem. The first step to a miracle is realizing that there's a problem. And we have a need. What happened here in Luke chapter 9? The disciples said, hey Jesus, we've got a problem. And you need to solve this problem. And he did. Every miracle that you read about in the scriptures, there was a problem and the presence of God changed it. Let me give you some examples. The first miracle that we would take a look at in the New Testament is Jesus was born of a virgin. 
There was a miracle that took place. Well, what was the problem? God solved the problem, and, and, and through this miracle, he was solving the problem of sin in the world because he knew that we needed a Savior, and there was no sacrifice worthy except for Jesus Christ. So he came in the flesh in a miracle to solve a sin problem. Then what's the next miracle that we see? That actually, when Jesus comes of age and Jesus is solving miracles, he changes water into wine. Well, what was the problem that took place here? Well, he was revealing his glory through this. And he was saying, the world needs to see me. They might not see me for who I am. They might not see that I carry the presence of God. So sometimes there are miracles in our life that God does when he is providing for his glory. And it's simply for the sake of reminding us or others who he actually is. We can go on. What did he do? He healed the royal official's son. Well, the royal official had heard about this Jesus. And he said, if this is God, then he can heal my son. That was the problem. There was the great hall of fish. He was casting out demons. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He healed the leper. He healed the withered hand. He raised the widow's son over and over and over. What we see is miracles cannot take place unless there's a problem. And some of us are praying in our life, God, I need to be at your table of provision because I need a miracle. And I don't want any problems in my life. I don't want to deal with any of the issues, but I would like to see a miracle. So if you could help me out. Listen, you only get miracles when there are problems. That's a part of the amazing provision that God gives to each and every one of us. But listen, we get so caught up in the problem that we forget That the end of the story is not the problem. The story is just the beginning that if we experience the presence of God will lead us to the miracle. But if we want to wrap ourselves up and occupy ourselves with this problem, God is certainly willing to let us do that. So that we get to a place that we discover that we have a need that cannot be met in any other way other than through the presence of God. The problem is not the end of the story. The problem here is just the beginning of the story that reminds us the power of the presence of God. But most of us, the majority of us probably, are a lot like the disciples here. The disciples saw the shortage. They forgot about the presence. The disciples saw the shortage of food. And they forgot about the power of the presence of God. We're a lot like the disciples. We're good at recognizing the shortages in our life. We're good at saying, God, I've got a problem with money in my life, or I've got a problem of job security, or, or I've got a problem with bills, or I've got a problem in my I've got all of this, pro- I've got all of these problems in my life. And we get so focused on the problems because we think the problem is the story, but the problem is not the story. The problem is the avenue that drives us deeper into his presence. And so we get to make the choice. Do we want to focus on the problem? Do we want to say, hey, the problem is my story? And if you've ever been on social media, you'll see that the problem is a lot of everybody's story. And they forget about the presence of God. We get so caught up in everything. And I wish that when we get caught up in the everything, then the next part of what we share would be, but I've got a powerful God who is more powerful than the shortage that I have in my life because I am living out of his presence. I like, though, how John, we, we read Luke's telling of this and his account of the feeding of the 5,000. I also like John's account. In, verse, in chapter 6, verse 5 of the book of John, John gives us something that Luke does not. John records, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, and imagine, imagine the great crowd of 5,000 coming towards him. This is what Jesus said to Philip. I, I, love, I love this. Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Jesus said to Philip, Where do you think we can go down to Publix and get a little bread for these people that they can have something to eat? Where are we going to go out here on the side of the grass? Where can we go to get some bread? How do you even answer Jesus? How do you say to him, I don't know. You're God. I'm I'm not God. I, I don't know about this. You are answering God. Ask you a question. 
And you've got to come up with an answer to give back to God. But look what happens in in verse 7. In verse 7, this was Philip's answer. I love this. It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have have a bite. You see, Philip isn't worried about the food. He's worried about the money. Even if there was a grocery store, even if we could just go down and pick up a, a, a public sub for all of these people to break and to, to pass around to everybody, uh, where are we going to get the money for all of this? And so this was Philip's response back to the God who said, where do you think that we're going to go get some fish and bread? Well, then they finally actually come up with what could potentially be a solution and they get some, fi- some loaves, and they get some actually bread. And this is what Matthew says about it. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 15. This is the desired place. And the hour is already late, Jesus said. Or the disciples actually said. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the village and buy themselves food. The disciples said to Jesus, this is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the village and buy themselves some food. So the disciples are saying, there's a problem. God, you asked Philip a question. We're not going to get into all of that. What we want you to do is to send everybody away so that they can go and they can get their own food. So here the disciples are actually trying to come up with a solution on their own. Well, what are the disciples doing? The disciples are running up to the top of the triangle. The disciples are saying, I'm going to go fix the assignment on my own. I'm going to bypass God over here on the right side of the triangle, and I'm just going to run up to the assignment, and here's our solution. All we have is five loaves and two fish. We can't feed all of these people. Even if we could go buy the food, we don't have the money to go buy the food for all these people. So God, what we, we've come up with a solution. Go send everybody away. You see, the disciples forgot about the reason They were there to begin with. And that was the presence of God. The presence of God drew these 5,000 or so people there. They were there not for the food. They were there because of the presence of God. And when a problem presented itself, the disciples came up with their own solution. Instead of asking God, I don't know, what do you think that we should do about this? Have you ever had that experience in your life? Have you ever had a problem present itself to you? And you think, what do I want to do about this? How am I going to solve this problem? Or have you ever, in sitting at the bottom of the triangle, had God ask you a question? And God's like, well, what are you going to do? And you think, oh, this is great. God's given me an opportunity. God's given me the opportunity to use this brain that he's given to me so that I can come up with a solution for the problem. But here's the deal. It's a test. In the same way that it was a test for Philip. Jesus said, what do you want to do? Philip's coming up with some solution. I'm sure that I wish that we had the fullness of this conversation and every single word recorded here. Because I can just imagine Philip going back to the other disciples and saying, hey, look, Jesus Ask me what I want to do about this. So what do you think that we should do about it? And then Philip says, I don't know. We don't have enough money to buy all of these people some food. And then we get from Matthew, and then we get it here in Luke as well, that they come back and they say, just send everybody away. So I imagine that there's this great conversation going on over here. And Jesus is over here looking at this conversation. They're trying to come up with a solution. And Jesus knows that he has the answer already. God is just waiting for them to come back and say, what do you think? What is the solution to this great problem that we have? What is the solution? Their solution was no solution at all. But Jesus was just waiting for the disciples to turn to him. Because he knew the people were there because of his presence. And his presence changes everything in all of life's problems. I want to say that again because I I want you to catch that. And if you take nothing else away from here today, that's what I want you to take away. His presence, God's presence, changes everything in all of life's problems. If you're running to a problem without his presence... You're fighting a losing battle. 
If you're looking for some type of solution and you have missed his presence, then you're going to lose. You might get lucky every once in a while. You might sustain yourself a little further down the road. But if you have not invited the God of the universe into the problem, then you will fail every time. The amazing thing here in Luke chapter 9 is Jesus said, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. You see, what Jesus is doing is providing the perfect opportunity for the disciples to say, God, we don't have any answers. He's just waiting for you to say to him, God, I've got a big problem. I've tried it on my own. I've tried to come up with some solutions. I've bought books. I've sought, I've sought wisdom. I've sought mint. I've, I've, I've come up. I've, I've tried all of this other stuff. And so in my failings, I'm coming to you, and I'm telling you that I don't have any answers. And I need the power of your presence in my life right now. In verse 13 of Luke 9, that's what Jesus wanted. He wanted the disciples to say, we don't have any answers. But instead, they tried to solve the problem all on their own. Now look, Jesus said, you give them something to eat. He already knew what he was going to do. Right? God is sovereign. God knows He knew what he was going to do. He knew how that he was going to solve this problem. He knew how he was going to take the loaves and the fishes, and he was going to break it, divide everybody up, and then he was going to feed a multitude, and they were going to pick up all these dozen basketfuls, and they would have all of these leftovers. God already knew that. Jesus knew that because he's God. But here he says, you give them something to eat. You see, Jesus is providing an invitation into the power of the presence of God that the disciples missed. And listen to Rock Crusher Church. I believe that God is giving us an invitation into his presence so that the sovereign God, the God who knows all things, brings us into his presence so that he can provide every answer to every problem that we have in the same way that he's doing that with your life. He's inviting you into his presence He's saying, you go give them something to eat. You go solve the problem on your own. But he's not giving you the license and free reign to do that. He's waiting for you to say, God, I can't and I need you. And then when, you hear, when, then when he hears that, and then at the perfect appointed time that the sovereign God has appointed, he steps in and the miracle overcomes the problem. So that the problem is shrunk, the problem is crushed, the problem is defeated because of the power of the presence of God. He knew what he was going to do. He knew the answer. He just wants us to wrestle with it and get to the place till we realize that we can't and we need him. We need the dependence of the Father. Alice McKenzie uh, wrote a book. It's, It's a great book and I would recommend it. It's You Want Me to Do What? That's the title of the book. In 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 that book, writing about this passage of Scripture, she puts it this way. Jesus' words, you give them something to eat, are daily care. What Jesus is saying is, I dare you to take me at my word and see what happens. And this gospel story may begin with an awful lot of hungry people sitting around on a hillside or in a remote place. But remember that the scene ends with the disciples moving through the crowds, lugging 12 baskets full of leftovers. That's the mental image that we ought to keep before us whenever we stand in the shoes of the disciples in this passage, passage, which, of course, is every single day of our lives. Listen, I don't care what kind of problems you face. I want you to know this morning that those problems did not Catch God off guard. No matter how big the mountain, no matter how foolish you may have been in some things, it didn't catch God off guard. He knows the problem. And in this huge catering feat that only he could solve here with no food with or with just a little bit of food, he wasn't caught off guard. And in whatever issue that you might have, whatever problem that you might have in your life, God is not sitting in heaven peering down at you saying, wow, I didn't think it was going to go that way. 
That's not how God works. God knew. And what God has done is allow some things into your life, hoping that those things would present themselves to you so that you realize that you can't and you need the power of the presence of God. God knows your problem, and he knows that you can't solve it on your own, and you need his power operating in your life. And listen, that's where we have to rest as a church. That's where we have to rest as individuals, with a God who provides everything that we need, absolutely everything that we need. That's the blessing of sitting at God's table. He is a provider. He is a way maker for you. He wants to take care of you. And when he says, you go give them something to eat, he wants you to run back to him and say, God, I can't. I can't do that. I can't do that on my own. I need your presence to go with me. In verse 14, Of Luke chapter 9, the disciples say back to Jesus. He said to his disciples, or Jesus said back to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. In 15 it says, the disciples did so and everybody sat down. And then we see God's powerful presence change the problem and provide a miracle. Jesus said, listen, this is what I want you to do. I'm giving you steps that you need to now go put into place. And I believe that had the disciples missed verse 15, we would have never uh, missed verse 14 when Jesus gave the, pro- gave the solution. Have everybody sit down in groups of about 50. I-, I want you to listen to what I'm telling you to do. And then had they missed Jesus taking it and giving thanks and, and then passing it and saying, I want you to go pass these out to your groups now. Had they missed those steps, they would have missed the miracle completely. But instead, when they realized that they had no solution, the power of the presence of God stepped into a situation. And then he gave specific things that needed to, to, be, to be accomplished. They did those things and then the miracle took place. But it all begins by living out of the presence of God. Presence always precedes provision. Presence always precedes provision. We want to jump to the provision. God supply. God give me. God do. And we forget the presence. This month as we focus on the table, I want to call you back. I want to stir in you a hunger For the power of the presence of God. Because presence precedes his provision. Him showing up and being present in our life always comes before we get the miracle. We have to learn to follow only after we have walked in his presence. Like verse 16, you have to step out and do what God has asked you to do. You have to step out and do what God has asked you to do. And so this morning, I want to ask you to shift any focus that you might have in your mind away from a problem, away from a need, away from an issue that you would have in your life and say, God, I'm not going to focus on those things. We'll get to those things. But right here and right now, I just want to be in your presence And then at the appropriate time, I know that if I am in your presence, that I am going to get to a place to where you actually provide and where you actually have given me the answers to the problems in my life. Here's the steps that took place in this miracle. God showed up. His presence was there. Jesus provided out of the presence of God. And then the disciples gave, Jesus gave to them, God provided, he wasn't surprised, he knew that they would need the loaves and the fishes. Jesus gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave what God gave to them away to the crowds that were sitting there. Sometimes what happens when we are craving God to provide, we're craving that provision of God, 
we then turn into spiritual or material hoarders. And we think, oh, this is great, God. Look all that you gave to me. Look everything that I've got right now. But what the disciples turned into here was simply the waitstaff. They weren't the cook. They weren't the one who placed the order to get the materials. They were just distributing what God had given to them. And whenever we stop focusing on problems, whenever we stop focusing on the issues in our life, and we start living out of his presence, and that power is experienced by us on a daily basis, what we realize is we're just a lot of weights. We're just wait staff. We don't have to go out and solve the issue. We don't have to prepare the solution for the issue. We're just passing out and distributing what God has given to each one of us. And when we start to live our life with a change of thinking in that way, it totally, totally changes your life. Because you're not living under some form of government here on the earth. You're not living out of capitalism. You're not living out of socialism. You're not living out of communism. You're living out of kingdom life. In kingdom life, God is the provider. We're just the waitstaff, distributing what God has given to us. So my call to you this morning is to stop focusing, stop focusing on any problem that you might have in your life and start craving his presence. Start craving, <coughs> excuse me, more of God in your life. This is what I want to leave you with this morning. Stop trying to solve the problem of the hungry multitudes on your own. You say, I don't have any hungry multitudes in my life. You've got a lot of problems that are hungry and they're craving more and more of you. When what those hungry multitudes in your life need, they don't need more of you. They don't need your resources. They need his resources. They need his provision. They need you to sit at his table in his presence so that he distributes to you. And then you just become a waitstaff, passing out what God has given to you. So stop trying to solve the problem of hungry multitudes on your own. And run to a God who's not surprised, a God who longs for you to be in his presence, and a God that through his presence will always provide for you.